Welcome and thanks for joining this quarter's Economic and Investment Outlook. I'm Ross Bramwell, a member of Heinrich Berg's investment team, and I'll be going through this quarter's presentation along with my colleague, Ford Donahue. To start, I'm going to summarize the main points that we'll discuss in this presentation. Longer term yields have declined since the Fed made their pause official in early November. The Fed's next move is likely a cut, but we do not believe it'll occur as early as markets are, are expecting. Although inflation has declined since the peak of 9.1 all the way down to 3.2% in February, history suggests the Fed may have more work to do. Even if the Fed has paused, the Fed will likely remain aggressive and hold rates steady in restrictive territory as inflation has remained sticky in the 3 to 4% range. Tighter lending conditions have reduced available credit to consumers and companies, which should continue to slow economic growth. However, larger savings and higher wages have kept consumers healthy and willing to spend so far. Leading economic indicators, they've declined for 23 consecutive months, but a tight jobs market has held off the much anticipated recession. While Q4 earnings growth in all of 2023 was really better than expected, company conference calls have highlighted lower revisions and weaker guidance going into 2024. Estimates for 2024's earnings growth are still around uh, 10%, but that's come down from 12%. And we believe those are likely to decline given the recent slowdown in spending and pressures on corporate margins. If inflation declines and unemployment stays low, maybe a soft landing is possible. Markets are currently pricing in an optimistic story of no additional rate hikes, rate cuts by this summer, and double-digit earnings growth. Although recession risk is currently lower, we believe higher rates throughout this year will slow the economy. So where does that leave us with positioning a portfolio? Although the Fed has acknowledged improvement in inflation, uh, inflation is still above its 2% target. Given elevated stock valuations after the recent rally and the risk of an economic slowdown due to tighter lending conditions for businesses and consumers, our outlook for stock remains a little cautious. Our outlook for stocks would shift more favorably when valuations decline to more reasonable levels or the leading economic indicators index ends its almost two year decline and turns positive. This chart highlights that, yes, we have seen a significant decline in the rate of inflation over the last 18 months. However, if we look at the last eight months or so, inflation has pretty much moved sideways and just been slightly choppy between 3% to 3.7%, which is above the 2% target. As many feared, the last 1% is proving be, to be the hardest to achieve. With oil prices higher this year and home prices also moving upwards again, we believe this will likely keep the Fed aggressive on rates and cautious before the Fed makes its first rate cut. I'll use a brief sports analogy that I also may refer to on later slides. You know, maybe you've seen a basketball game where one team is leading the entire game, but the other team keeps the score close and on the final shot of the game before the clock expires, the team that was behind the entire game hits a shot and wins it on the last shot. The Fed has been winning in its battle against inflation so far. We are not in a recession, but until the Fed can cut rates and shift its policy out of restrictive territory and the U.S. economy still avoids a recession while getting inflation down to its target, can we say that the Fed was ultimately victorious? In other words, the game is not over yet. But on the whole, inflation has been coming down over time, and the Fed has acknowledged a significant improvement we have seen on inflation. This chart supports a thesis that if we were to remove housing costs from the aggregate calculation, that CPI X shelter is already below the 2% target. The Fed has talked about its expectations that housing costs should continue to decline this year, and that would open the door for rate cuts later this year. So we are nearing the goal line, but with additional fiscal stimulus lined up for this year and still a lack of new supply of housing nationally, it's not a sure bet that inflation will easily break below the 3% inflation level and stay there, which is likely what the Fed wants to see accomplished. In prior presentations, we've looked at the growth of money supply and how it has impacted the economy. We had a massive increase in 2020 and early 2021 during the pandemic, here shown in the red line of growth in the money supply. And then there was about a 16 month lag until we saw the peak in inflation here in the tan line, which indicates how monetary and fiscal actions can take a while to impact the economy. The bottom chart just shows the correlation with CPI at a 16 month lag to make it clear. The decrease in stimulative measures after the pandemic also led to a decrease in inflation over time that we've seen over the last 18 months. So what I wanna point out is that over the last few months shown here at the far right of the top chart is that we've actually seen a reversal 
where it is expected that the growth in money supply will turn positive in the coming months, again due to fiscal and monetary policies which have eased financial conditions. This goes back to the point that Fed Chairman Powell has reiterated over time, that he is very worried about historical trends that inflation rarely comes and goes in one wave. He knows that there are likely additional stimulative actions that will be taken this year to support the economy in an election year. If the Fed cuts rates while we are still having strong economic data, that would be by itself stimulative and could create likely inflationary pressures. At the end of the day, it is just another element of why we believe the Fed is more likely to be patient on rate cuts. It does not want to stoke the the cooling coals of inflation, let's say. We believe the Fed wants to pour that cold water on any coals of inflation and make sure inflation is trending down to its 2% target. As Chairman Powell has said before, and I believe him, that the Fed is willing to risk a slowdown or even a recession versus letting inflation rise again. We are often asked about the impact of higher interest rates on U.S. government debt. And for years, I've said that both parties in Congress have the remarkable ability and willingness to kick the can down the road. Neither party has wanted to deal with debt issues. And because rates were artificially low for so many years, it was never an issue. It was fairly easy to let the deficit grow when interest rates were so low and the economy was growing. But that has changed over the last 18 months. For the first time last fall, when longer term yields began to rise pretty rapidly and the 10 year almost touched 5%, it was the first time we saw some fear in the markets and talk in DC that someone might have to act. Higher yields caused a three-month decline in in stocks last August through October. However, in early November, the Fed pivoted in its fight against inflation and made it clear that its next move would likely be a rate cut. This was a game changer for yields, which have now retreated to lower levels since then. The Fed pretty much let Congress off the hook once again, at least for now, as the pressure has been released on any near-term activity to tackle the debt because rates have come down. However, the risk is still out there. We know that our government debt issuance is going to increase this year, as shown by the U.S. government's own projections in this chart. But with the expectations that the Fed is going to cut rates this year, we are unfortunately once again in a range where the can is likely going to be kicked further down the road. The number of Treasury buyers has been reduced over the last few years, so any significant new supply could push up yields once again. The U.S. Treasury will be walking a fine line to ensure yield levels don't push up too high to create an environment similar to what we had last fall. Historically, the Fed has not stopped a rate hiking cycle before its key rate has moved higher, often significantly higher than CPI. With the Fed funds rate currently at 5.5% and inflation declining to 3.2%, although it ticked up a little bit higher from 3.1% last month, It has let the Fed pause, but with inflation remaining sticky above 3%, if the Fed were to cut, that difference would narrow quickly, and it may very well increase inflationary pressures given recent solid economic data. One of the issues the Fed has had is that markets have often not believed its messaging and guidance. Fed members have said that they expect it will be appropriate to cut rates at some point in 2024, but there is no timetable set. As we began 2024, the consensus from Fed members was for three rate cuts this year. However, as that seemed to be a step towards where the market was expecting cuts, the market got even more optimistic and priced in up to six rate cuts in 2024, shown by the brown line, uh, shown by the number of hikes expected in early 2024. If the Fed were to cut six times in 2024, it's more likely because economic data has weakened significantly. Although the Fed acknowledged the next move is likely a cut, we believe it will be cautious in moving too soon. Given recent strong jobs data and hotter than expected inflation reports, the markets have recently pulled back their expectations and now believe the Fed's first cut will will occur in late spring or summer with an additional three cuts this year, now shown by the yellow line in decreasing number of of, uh, cuts that are expected this year. Right now, a lot of good news is priced into the market, including no additional rate cuts, no recession, a soft landing scenario, and rate cuts by June. A miss on any one of those expectations could likely mean a setback for the markets. j Powell has often talked about the significance of the job market and its important relationship to inflation. Our economy has transitioned to be a predominantly service-oriented economy. One of the largest input, inputs to cost in a service economy is wages. As we have seen in the last two years, wages go up when there's a higher demand for workers than the available workers looking for jobs. 
This is seen in the top left chart with the incredible number of job openings, the increase that we saw after the pandemic that has only come down slightly in the last couple of years. When we look, when we look in the um, upper right hand chart, we can see that the economy continues to add jobs month after month, showing the tight jobs market. When we look at the bottom charts of initial and continued unemployment claims, we can see that the job market has remained relatively strong and generally those who have been laid off have been able to find another job. So overall, the job market remains tight, even though we have seen some recent weakness. This is one of the reasons the Fed believes it may have to do more or keep rates a little bit higher for, for longer. Of these charts, the continuing claims chart may be the most important currently, as it will indicate if employees who have been laid off are able to find jobs quickly. We would expect the number of job openings to continue to come down if workers are staying unemployed for longer. But just to highlight how quickly economic data can change and, and also to highlight some of that weakness we've seen recently. But don't worry, I won't change my story that the job market is still a pillar to consumer strength. But I am going to acknowledge some recent weakness in employment data around manufacturing and small businesses that we're seeing here and also about the overall sentiment about the ability to find jobs. Workers are not job hopping at the rate they were two years ago. Wages are still growing, but employers are finding a little more leverage these days in hiring and also compensation. Going back to my basketball game analogy, this just shows that risks still remain if these trends persist in, in employment and rates stay higher for longer. The job market, as we've seen historically, can often turn very quickly. But the much anticipated recession has not happened. And one of the main reasons is the strong jobs market that has kept consumers employed and with cash in their pockets that they were more than willing to spend. The unemployment rate has crept up from a historical low of 3.4% to the current 3.9% unemployment rate. That's after it moved up just slightly last week from 37 To get back to my main question though, I believe the unemployment rate is one of the key data points that the Fed is watching. If the rate continues to creep up towards 4% or higher, it will indicate a slowing economy and that the Fed is likely ready to look at rate cuts due to the impact of rate hikes still filtering through the economy and softening the jobs market. But if the unemployment rate starts to dip lower back towards historical lows, then the Fed may believe it has more work to do and that it will likely mean higher for longer. We believe, we believe the unemployment rate over the next few months may give us a clue into what direction the Fed is going later in 2024. We look closely at the leading economic indicators or LEIs to evaluate the prospects of a recession. We have now had 23 consecutive months of negative LEI readings as shown here in the red. If you look at the left-hand chart, the gray bars represent recessions. And looking at the current decline of 23 months, it certainly looks like we should be in a recession. But as shown in the bottom right-hand chart, which lists coincident economic indicators, we can see that the job market continues to hold up and is supporting consumers and the economy in the face of several economic headwinds. The trends have not significantly de deteriorated. Coincident indicators try to represent real-time changes in the economy, and there is still a strong trend in the jobs market, as shown in the tan line here on the left-hand side. Whereas we can see the weakening trends in most other areas of the economy. We have not seen a divergence like we currently have between the two in the last 30 years, and so far the jobs market is winning its argument. We are long-term investors and believe long-term trends such as corporate earnings and economic growth tend to drive the markets. However, we have to acknowledge that many of the historical indicators around recessions have not worked this time around. Our economy continues to evolve and it's hard to know exactly when the pendulum will swing to the other way. So while we are pleased that the economy continues to hold up and stocks have rallied over the last four months, we still are a little cautious on our outlook for stocks going forward. In this chart, we can see several underlying trends that are a little worrisome for the, for the economy. Consumer confidence. So here we have on the right-hand side, the previous uh, reading and then the current reading for the first week uh, of March. So in this chart, we can see several underlying trends that have, we has showed some weakening. Consumer confidence and personal spending have been slipping. Uh, recently, and they could indicate a more cautious consumer. Uh, February's inflation reports right here in the middle all came in hotter than expected, which is not what the Fed wants to see as it's weigh weighing uh, rate cuts. Lastly, manufacturing activity continues to decline, as we see here on the bottom. Last week, we had the lowest durable goods order in four years. 
until we have some clarity that the Fed has the ability to cut rates without economic activity seeing a broad decline, we are likely to remain a little cautious in our outlook. Just a quick note before we transition to a more in-depth look at the U.S. stock market. Broadly, the U.S. is still holding up much better in regards to economic conditions and growth than the rest of the world. In this chart, a reading above 50 indicates growth and a, a green color. A reading below 50 indicates contraction and would lean towards yellow and then to red indi indicating greater contraction. The U.S. is the only major economy that is above its pre-pandemic estimates for growth in its economic size and workforce. Below the red arrow here for the fourth quarter of 2023, you can see that many of the trends looking around the globe, that they were rather negative, especially in Europe. The U.S. has realized better economic growth. We really do not expect these trends to change this year, which is why we still expect that we're going to continue to lean overweight in our exposure to U.S. stocks versus international stocks. Hello, I'm Ford Donahue, and I'll be taking you through the next slides. Now, let's take a look at what is going on with valuations, growth, and some of the biggest themes that we see playing out in the U.S. stock market right now. As long-term investors, Earnings growth is one of the most important drivers of our outlook for equity investments. While stocks can be unpredictable in the short term, long-term equity returns are highly correlated with the underlying earnings growth of the investment. The gray dots on this chart show the year-over-year -year earnings from the S&P 500 index companies each quarter going back to 2022 and looking forward into 2024. In the middle of the chart, you will see that the S&P 500 went through an earnings recession in late 2022 and early 2023, when we saw earnings decline for three consecutive quarters. While many expected that this earnings recession to extend into a full-blown economic recession, we have not yet seen that. In fact, S&P 500 earnings have surprised to the upside over the last two quarters, and we have seen earnings resume positive growth in late 2023 and we expect that, that to continue with a near 10% earnings growth rate for the S&P 500 in 2024. This chart further breaks down the earnings growth, or decline, in the S&P 500 into contributions from sales growth and margin expansion. A positive brown bar indicates that sales growth was positive, and a positive maroon bar indicates that margins expanded. Vice versa, negative means that margins contracted. We can see that as early as Q1 2022, Corporate America was struggling with margin pressures as margins declined throughout 2022 and through 2Q 2023. This margin pressure was largely due to inflation as input costs rose and wage pressures were up. It's notable that throughout this rough period for the market and the economy, sales growth remained positive, suggesting that the consumer was still strong and buyers were still purchasing goods. Looking ahead from Q3 2023 and into 2024, both sales and margins are expected to contribute positively to earnings growth. This is a sign of a healthy economy and gives support for our expectations that corporations are on sound footing to deliver positive earnings growth this year. After a rough 2022, the stock market has seen a dramatic recovery over the past 12 months. The chart on the left shows that the S&P 500 index has increased by almost 28% over the past 12 months. This chart further breaks that return down into two components. First, multiple growth, or how much more expensive the market has become. And second, earnings growth, or how much of that return has been justified by growth in earnings. As we discussed just a minute ago, earnings growth has been essentially flat over the past 12 months. You can see on the maroon line here that total earnings growth for the S&P 500 over the past 12 months has been just 1.4%. The vast majority of the return in the market over the past 12 months has been delivered through multiple expansion, meaning that investors are paying 26% more per, do per dollar of earnings and that stocks are 26% more expensive than they were a year ago. The chart on the right takes a look at valuations on the S&P 500 index over time. Specifically, we're looking at the PE or price to earnings ratio that investors are paying to buy into the stock market. This is the most common data point that investors use to gauge how cheap or expensive the market is. PE ratios typically hover between 15 times earnings on the cheap side and 23 times earnings on the expensive side. In the circle on the far right, 
you will see that valuations have gotten significantly more expensive over the past 12 months, leading to that 26% multiple growth or expansion, which has pushed the market higher. Why would investors be willing to pay 26% more for $1 of earnings today than they were a year ago? There are likely several reasons for that. First, we have a much better handle on inflation today than we did 12 months ago. We are much more confident that the Fed is done hiking rates, and for the first time in a while, we have confidence that corporate earnings are going to start growing in the months and quarters ahead. We believe that it's imperative that corporate America deliver on these earnings growth expectations to keep the market moving higher from here. Now, let's talk about two of the main themes that have been driving the market higher over the past year. The first is the emergence of the magnificent seven stocks. For those who haven't heard, there are seven massive technology-focused companies, Apple, Microsoft, NVIDIA, Amazon, Google, Meta, and Tesla, that now comprise about a third of the S&P 500 index weighting and that have generated extraordinary returns over the past several years. These returns have helped push the US market to new highs, even as the majority of other public companies, both at home and abroad, have struggled to deliver earnings growth. $10,000 invested into an equal weighted basket of these seven stocks 10 years ago would be worth nearly $200,000 today, representing a 35% annualized rate of return. This makes the above average 13% rate of return for the market look minuscule. With the growth in earnings and stock price has come expensive valuations. These magnificent seven stocks traded an average multiple of earnings of 37 times compared to a 24 times multiple for the market as a whole and 21 times for the market not including these companies. After seeing these returns, we might assume that these stocks are outrageously expensive. But a closer look at the underlying fundamentals of these companies suggests that much of the returns that we have seen by these magnificent seven stocks has been justified. The chart on the left side of this page looks at each of the last four years. The returns of these seven stocks then breaks that return down into three components. First, growth in sales. Second, growth in margins. And finally, increases in valuations. Sales growth plus margin growth combine to tell us the total earnings growth of the company. Changes in PE ratio tell us how much more expensive or cheap a stock has become. While these numbers vary from year to year, if we move over to the far right of this chart, we can see that these stocks have returned on average 28% per year over the last four years. 27% of that growth is from a combination of sales, 21%, and margins, 6%. Just 1% of that return is from increasing PE ratios. This is telling us that the vast majority of the returns that we're seeing in these stocks is due to improvement in their underlying fundamentals. They're selling more product, and they're doing it in a more efficient way. Very little of this return is due to stocks getting more expensive. The table on the right side of this page just shows a quick snapshot of the earnings growth of these companies in Q4 2023 compared to the rest of the market. As you can see, these magnificent seven stocks grew their earnings on average 56% year over year in the most recent quarter, compared to a minus 2% earnings decline for the rest of the stocks in the S&P 500. This earnings growth has been the main driver of the returns in these stocks in recent years. And for this reason, we do not feel that investors need to shy away from these stocks and they should continue to play a prominent role in a diversified equity portfolio. As these seven companies continue to grow, they have come to represent approximately one third of the S&P 500 index. There is concern that major market indices like the S&P 500 are becoming overly concentrated. While we certainly would prefer to see a more diversified list of companies grow to compete in size with these seven market leaders, we believe that there's much more diversification at the top of the market than meets the eye. In decades past, the largest companies in the market were often narrowly focused on one business line, such as oil and gas exploration or banking. Today, many of the top companies are incredibly diversified businesses that generate revenue from a variety of sources. Apple, which we mostly know for the iPhone, generates almost half of its revenue from other sources, including services such as Apple TV, wearables, including the Apple Watch, and legacy businesses, including the Mac and iPad. Microsoft, which is most well known for its business software solutions such as Microsoft Office, now generates more revenue from its cloud storage business than any other business line. It continues to operate several other success successful business lines, including gaming and computing. 
And finally, Amazon, which is best known for its online store, has a variety of other diversifying business lines, including Amazon Web Services, Small Business Services, Amazon Prime TV, and Whole Foods. In conclusion, while we hope that other companies continue to grow their businesses in the coming years to help diversify major US market indices, we believe that these mega cap companies at the top are sufficiently diversified businesses to make us less concerned that our portfolios are overly concentrated in any one business model. The last equity market topic that we wanted to touch on is the rapid growth and in interest in artificial intelligence, or AI. There is no doubt that rapid improvements in technology in this area have the potential to increase productivity and fuel economic growth in the coming years. We have received several questions as to whether we should be leaning into AI and adjusting portfolios to take on more exposure to this theme. Similar to the discussion on the Magnificent Seven, the market has evolved over the past several years to have significant exposure to companies that supply or utilize the AI industry. The tables on the left show a list of some of the larger companies in the S&P 500 that generate revenues from or are focused on growth within the AI space. These comp companies represent about 30% of the S&P 500 index today. A few years ago, this would have been much smaller. Growth focused funds, which many of our clients have exposure to, have an even higher amount of exposure to the AI space. As a result, we believe that investors in a diversified equity market portfolio already have material exposure to the AI theme and do not need to lean further into this area. Markets are highly anticipating when the Fed will be able to begin to cut rates. These are important assumptions that investors use to price the overall stock market and individual stocks. However, historically, rate cuts have not been a positive for the stock market. U.S. stocks have done okay after a pause, which we're currently in. But after the first rate cut, the S&P 500 has declined on average over 20% over the next 8 to 10 months. Historically, the market has not bottomed before a recession or before the first rate cut. The Fed is typically cutting rates because economic conditions are weakening. So a pause and even a rate cut does not mean that we've achieved a soft landing. Now, we are certainly in unprecedented times when historical norms are not leading to the predicted outcomes. But until we have clarity on when and if the Fed will be able to cut rates and economic indicators still will be able to reverse course and move higher, we are still likely to remain a little bit cautious in our outlook. Now I'm just gonna spend a few minutes on politics since we have an election coming up fairly quickly. As I've always stated, it is unlikely that we will make an allocation change due to potential outcomes of an election. Political events tend to only have a short term moves up or down until longer term implications and legislation is hammered out, which may be very difficult in the current environment. We have taken similar stances with geopolitical events or natural disasters that tend to have short but very unpredictable moves. We firmly believe that earnings are the long-term drivers of markets. And an election event just on its own does not lead to long-term changes in earnings. It's more important to follow the legislation or policies that could change the direction of earnings and the markets. On the chart on the right, history shows that the stock market is rather nonpartisan. Both parties have raised and lowered taxes. Both have created large deficits and all along the way, corporate America and the US economy continues to be the most innovative and in ever evolving economy in the world. We will continue to follow the leading candidates and potential policy changes, but we do not expect to be making significant, al significant allocation changes leading up to the 2024 uh, election. On the left-hand chart though, if you like historical trends, it is noteworthy that rarely has the stock market had a negative return in an election year with an incumbent. In fact, they've all been positive since 1944. I could also show some charts that indicate historically that GDP and fiscal stimulus tend to be higher than average as well in election years. It makes sense that no one wants a recession in an election year, so the stock market tends to do well. However, markets can be choppy. The dark blue line shows the average return throughout the year if the incumbent party loses. Markets tend to decline in the middle of the primary season and then also leading up to the, the election. However, I will point out that this year is, uniquely, uh, is unique historically, and that is the earliest that the two likely nominees from each party have already pretty much wrapped up their party's nomination. So this may not be a typical cycle. Regardless of who wins the White House, the most likely characteristic of DC that will not change is gridlock. Given how small factions in both parties have had an outsized influence on legislation and just the processes within DC over the last several years now, that is unlikely to change. 
So let's wrap up the presentation with a reminder of how volatile returns can be year over year in the stock market, but that the most important element that is critical to achieving long-term returns is time invested. The chart on the left shows annual returns going back to 1920 and shows the return chronologically going left to left to right. The returns appear pretty random, but on the right, we can see the consistent returns investors have achieved over time, whether 5, 10, 15, 20, or even going uh, longer. This is just a reminder that all of the volatility that we see in the in the investment world, you know, in the markets, you know, maybe even due to, to election in election years, they, that volatility is built into a financial plan. The stocks could go up 10% or 20%. They could go up or down, you know, 15, 20, 25% in, in any year. And the same, it's the same for all the asset classes in a diversified portfolio, including bonds, which have seen more volatility in recent years. So even though there continues to be risk and opportunities in today's markets, we still believe investors sticking to their financial plan is most likely to help clients achieve their desired outcomes. Thanks again for taking the time to watch this video. If you have any further questions, please reach out to a member of your client service team.